Hello, everyone. Welcome to the United States Heartland China Association's The Way Forward webinar. The topic today is Future of Public Health and the Role of Global Partnership. My name is Min Fan. I'm the Executive Director of the U.S. Heartland China Association. We're honored to partner with University of Southern California, U.S. China Institute, to make this public event possible. And we also want to thank our sponsor, Guardians of the Angela Charitable Foundation, which is a public charity that has donated millions of units of PPEs to many, many clinics, homeless shelters, civil organizations across the United States. It is thanks to their effort, we were able to channel a lot of donation to the heartland states and cities. And also want to thank Carter Center uh, to get the word out for this very important discussion. So next, I'd like to introduce a uh, welcome, the chairman of our nonprofit, Governor Bob Holden, to give his opening remarks. Governor. Thank you, man, and thanks, Clay, for being the moderator today. And, and what I think is one of the most important webinars uh, that we've had. The Way Forward is the title of this program. It's been the title of all of our programs because I want us to look to the future because we've got to be able to address the problems. Uh, the two topics today couldn't be more important for all of us. The future of public health and the role of global partnership as we go forward. And this panel today, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on how we can cross the bridge to bring us together so we can solve the problems facing all of us around the world. So men, thank you again for your work and I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Governor Holden. And next, I'd like to introduce our moderator today. Clay heads the University of Southern California, U.S.-China Institute, which focuses on the multidimensional and evolving U.S.-China relationship. He was trained as a historian working on modern Chinese economic history. Clay lived in China for five years and has visited over 50 times for research, to lead delegations, or to lecture. Clay has long been committed to working to inform public discussion of U.S.-China ties. He was associate editor of the academic journal Modern China and editorial director for the online magazines Asia Media, Asia Pacific Arts, and U.S.-China Today. He's produced documentary films, including the Institute's 12-part Assignment China series, American reporting on China from the 1940s to today. Clay writes the Institute's Talking Points newsletter and is author of several guides to teaching about China. And he's earned teaching awards at three universities. Thank you, Clay, for moderating today. And now I'll turn over to you. Thank you, Min. Thank you, Governor Holden. And apologies to all of you for that long introduction. I am the least important participant in this discussion. My job is mainly just to keep things going. We are so fortunate to have all of you. Uh, we have viewers from across the globe uh, who are, have the opportunity to ask questions. Many of you have already raised questions. We received a couple dozen uh, via email ahead of time. And you have the opportunity to raise questions by scrolling to the bottom of your Zoom screen clicking on that Q&A button and submitting your question. I have to tell you now, it's going to be a very busy session today. So we may not be able to get to every single question, but we'll seek to do as many as we can. We have such an extraordinary panel, such a range of experience and expertise. It is a real delight to have them with us. And so you folks, it's different times wherever you might be. Uh, we have a couple of participants joining us from, uh, from the Pacific region. So we have Dr. Vivian Lin, who is the uh, uh, Executive Associate Dean and Professor of Public Health Practice in Hong Kong at the University of Hong Kong. A distinguished career uh, in academia, but also working with various organizations at the national level in Australia and elsewhere, and also working with the World Health Organization, heading up their office of, uh, of, of 
uh, systems, uh, health systems oversight. And so she's going to be participating from Hong Kong, where it's already late in the evening. Uh, similarly, we have Professor uh, Wu Zunyo, who is a director at the Chinese Centers for Disease Control. She, he's coming to us also from, uh, from the region, from Beijing, and it's in the evening there. He is a prominent specialist, worldwide specialist, in HIV AIDS and sexually transmitted diseases. He earned his uh, PhD in public health here in Los Angeles at that other university, the University of California, Los Angeles. He has published extensively and received the UN AIDS gold medal in 2008. Usually based in Beijing is Dr. Yang uh, Gonghuan, and she's today, though, coming to us from the East Coast of the United States, uh, where she's living in New York. She is a distinguished, uh, distinguished scholar, professor at Peking Union Medical Center, and she's the former vice director of China's Centers for Disease Control. She's obviously written many scientific papers, but she's also been very involved in public education campaigns. Uh, she's involved in informing the public, recently publishing a piece in the news mag magazine, Tsai Xin. Uh, and she's been interviewed on the current COVID-19 crisis extensively. She's a world leader in anti-tobacco campaigns, which is, of course, a giant health factor. We're delighted to have her with us. We also have with us uh, Professor Bruce Y. Lee, who is uh, a teacher of health policy and management and at the City University of New York and the executive director of the Public Health Informatics Computational Operations Research, this center looking at marrying data to medicine, developing data models to help aid decision makers. He's previously taught at Johns Hopkins at the University of of Pittsburgh, and he too is very much involved, not just in the production of scientific papers, but in informing the public about many of these issues. He has a regular column in Forbes magazine, and his work has been widely published in other major news sources. Our fifth panelist, it's going to be a busy day today, is Mike Sparfka. And Mike has this long career uh, in industry and has worked in academia as well. He's now principal consultant at Woodford Research. He's an expert in the pharmaceutical industry looking at pharmaceutical compliance, the compliance of pharmaceutical companies uh, in their work, in their research, research integrity looms large in that area, but also in the economics of pharmacological questions. He's trained as an epidemiologist. He earned his PhD at the University of Minnesota and has worked for industry leaders such as Procter & Gamble and Amgen. So that's a mouthful just to highlight the distinguished panel that we have before you. As Governor Holden has already said, no topic touches people in the way, of course, as health. We are, of course, living through this massive pandemic, COVID-19. And we have people who have worked extensively in that field, including Dr. Uh, Wu Zunyo, and he'll be talking a little bit about that. Uh, Dr. Yang has also been uh, writing and talking on this field, and the others will contribute expertise as well. But public health is more than just what's in the news at the moment. The public health systems we rely on to help us improve our daily lives, to encourage good behaviors, to nourish healthy practices, and to help governments and individuals build a more healthy environment, to extend lives and improve every minute of every day of our lives here. So public health looks at environmental concerns, disease transmission, 
all sorts of things that are involved. We have national and local systems of public health, and our experts have been involved in looking at these. Now, we know that often healthcare is seen as a very expensive product, a very expensive service. In the United States, it absorbs a huge amount of our gross domestic product. But we also know that not investing in public health systems can have catastrophic impact. We're seeing some of that right now, uh, needing to shut down such a significant share of the global economy. So investing in public health, although we may not do enough of it, pays dividends, and we need to talk a little bit more about that. So as we proceed, proceed this morning, we're in, it's morning in Southern California, evening in Beijing and Hong Kong, and uh, a little bit deeper into the morning for the folks back east. But in any case, as we proceed, we're going to be looking at uh, comparisons between the US and Chinese public health systems, but our focus also is on cooperation between them. And in fact, many people on the panel today have been deeply involved in very productive, effective cooperation across the Pacific, linking the United States and China. Our focus is what can we do going forward? How can we act in such a way that it benefits people in China, benefits people in the United States, and elsewhere? So that's where, we're, that's where we're focused. Now, let me begin with the panel by asking, you know, about our systems today. Do the United States and China sufficiently emphasize, sufficiently nourish and support their public health systems? What changes might be taken to strengthen these, to improve these? Uh, and I'd like to begin in terms of looking at this question with Professor Vivian, Vivian Lin, who has, was educated here in the United States, uh, here in California, I would emphasize, but also has deep experience working in Australia and at the international level. Professor Lin, where are we in terms of our public health systems? Thank you so much, Clay, and it's such a great pleasure to be part of this conversation. And just to actually draw my links to the heartland, I actually took a semester off when I was in college and did, did a public health internship in Houston, um, Harris County, uh, Texas. So um, that's where I really got my public health start. Um, and, and of course, as a public health person, it would be very easy for me to say, of course, no country pays sufficient attention, but I think it warrants a little bit more distillation of what that actually means. So perhaps I could start with one short story and give tales of two public health systems, China and US, as illustration of the challenges. So back around 1995, I would say, I had the privilege of having lunch um, in Beijing with the Chinese health minister, an official from the World Bank, Professor Chen Chunming, who was then the head of the China Chinese Academy of Preventive Medicine, which is what the CDC used to be called, and Jeff Copeland, who was formerly a director of US CDC. And Professor Chen produced a book commemorating the 10th anniversary of CAPM and thanked Jeff as the US CDC for the US assistance. Um, and Jeff said, um, at the time, we said, did the Chinese want an NIH model or a CDC model? Because the Academy of Preventive Medicine was established by taking out institutes from within the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences. And Professor Chen said, yes, we went with the NIH model. Now, if we move forward into history. Um, excellent researchers doing wonderful things. Uh, but when SARS came, uh, of course, it wasn't just a problem of CDC. It was an entire dysfunction of the health system um, in total. But 
really the Chinese CDC system really had to build, be built from there because with the economic reforms, while people got rich, there was less and less funding. What was visible cured hospitals people would pay money for. What was invisible prevention people would not pay for. So by the time SARS hit in 2003, there was no operating money. There was no requirement for data to be passed from one system to another. Uh, the labs were really in, you know, not very good shape. So that really caught into uh, the, the for the importance of investing in public health systems. The whole point of public health system is to be ready for any disease, doesn't matter which one, and to have it a connected system. And I think we, if we look at the Chinese response to COVID, we could see how important that investment was. But I should also say that while there was a fix on the CDC system, the personal healthcare system was really falling apart. And access to care, to preventive services, to primary healthcare was very, very difficult, especially for the poor. And it was really not until 2009 that we saw a comprehensive health reform in the Chinese system. So that's kind of another story to be told. But there was certainly a recognition, and there is now, again. Now, China was learning from CDC, but the US CDC as an iconic global institution has also had its ups and downs. Um, in the 1990s, after Proposition 13 in California, we really saw the decline of funding for public health and became very, very concerned that the infrastructure and the capacity was um, becoming less and less and whether the US would be ready for bioterrorism for pandemics. And so there was a huge amount of work that was done. The CDC set up the Public Health Practice Office. And again, a couple of really key people um, who are from the heartland contributed to this rethink. Um, Paul Halverson, who was uh, later on director of health in Arkansas and then founding dean of public health in Indiana, and also Glenn Mays, who is a professor of health policy and management in Colorado. So the U.S. really set the global standard on thinking about public health system, defining core public health functions, essential health services, looking at stand performance standards, thinking about the workforce. So all the things that would go into a strong system. Now, of course, US is federalized. It's very decentralized. It makes it much more difficult, given the political complexities and administrative complexities, to have a uniformly strong. And of course, in recent years, we've also seen decline of public health funding and the global reach. So I think what we see everywhere is that when there's a crisis, people then pay attention to public health. And when things are good and public health is doing its job, then people get complacent. And the WHO picks that up everywhere. Yeah, so this is a great point about uh, seeing public health as you might see an emergency service. Uh, such as the police department, the fire department, uh, responding in times of need. And people generally understand you need to invest in those institutions even when the building is not on fire. You need to prepare for that moment. You can't call it into being the instant it's needed. But also, of course, you have the preventative role that you emphasized. And we have the issue of access. Uh, the healthcare reforms in China, the healthcare reforms in the United States have been focusing on increasing access in these ways. Uh, now, we have two leaders, people who have played important roles in the public health systems in China. We have Dr. Wu and Dr. Yang with us, uh, and they have been involved with the Centers 
for disease control in China, but also involved at the university level with instruction. Dr. Young, would you like to say something, uh, please, about about the Chinese public health system? And because, of course, you're also resident here uh, right now in New York, you've observed the American public health system as well. Uh, I just uh, is a follow the very nice story. It's the 2002, uh, China is set up, the CDC, just uh, based on the, um, just uh, on the prevent, Chinese preventive medicine, Chinese public health uh, uh, institute. So, second um, year, so, that's 2003, it's in China, it's the SARS outbreak. So after the after the after break of SARS, the the government is pay more attention for the strengthen the public health system. We set up it's the information system, especially for the infectious disease um, control. And uh, so maybe everybody think uh, that's okay, it's for the China, but uh, it's the several years ago, we find it's the Ch public health system is still the weaker. It's weaker and weaker. So, and uh, it's more and more students from the public health school don't work, it's in the areas. They go to hospital, they go to the company because it's in this system, no more funding, and the pay is lower. So that's why this, this year is when the COVID-19 outbreak. So people is in Chinese quality, it's discuss. It's how to strengthen the public health system. So it's maybe it's more and more people think as there is maybe it's we should strengthen the law and regulation. Maybe we should it's the uh, it's the update the information system. Maybe we should. It's the to the give it more funding, give it the um, strengthen the capacity of uh, staff, especially it's in the basic level staff. But I think maybe of course this is the very very important very important, but I think it's more important is the is a key point is government and the whole society is don't pay more attention for the public health. It's why. So I have given you the uh, story. It's the 2009, it's China started to the medical reform. That uh, is pay more, government is pay more attention for the hospital. So just uh, it's for the public health system, only, only just uh, uh, it's, uh, it didn't give you some more attention as the huge money is for the hospital. And uh, for, so that's why it's uh, medical reform just uh, is weaken the public health system. No. And, uh, yeah, and uh, the second point is for the whole society, it's the People always think if we disease control, uh, control disease, maybe just need the medicine, need the, some of the high tech um, measures. Don't, don't pay more attention it's for this, the, maybe it's simple, but with the user measures. You've raised several big points, and I'd like to turn to Professor Wu. Professor Young talked about a problem that exists in the United States as well, uh, drawing in talented, committed people 
into public health and retaining them, uh, you know, because in some cases they might get better rewards outside the public health system. But also the question of uh, funding and the application of technology. We're going to be focusing on technology questions in just a moment, but Professor Wu, would you like to comment about the strengths, the possible weaknesses in the two systems? I think in the United States, you still have the strongest public health system. So there are a few uh, points to support there. The first, uh, I think uh, the um, United States has the largest, uh, uh, the competent uh, public health specialist in the world. So if you look at uh, the total number uh, for public health specialists, so United States have uh, accounted for the most. And uh, United States, particularly like a US CDC, it's a global uh, health authority and have a great influential globally who could handle a wide range of public health emergency and challenges. So, so whatever we have the issues, we look at, we try to get answer guidelines from the US CDC website. Uh, just look at response to COVID-19. Even in the US, you have the uh, largest uh, outbreak in the uh, worldwide. However, your health system still able to uh, deal with uh, this epidemic. It, uh, the system does not crash. That means you have very strong public health system to cope with this challenge. In the China, so we are growing. So we learn from the uh, US, particularly for the public health system. So we transfer from uh, uh, Chinese Academy of Pre Preventive Medicine as a research uh, academic institute to a public health agency like uh, China CDC. Even the name we uh, copied from the US, so we call it China CDC. So uh, what we uh, have improved is uh, uh, take a lesson from uh, uh, SARS outbreak in the 2003. So we paid a lesson, then we uh, invested uh, uh, in the public health, then the capacity uh, increased or enhanced to respond to the uh, respond to outbreak. So after SARS outbreak, we, re we responded to uh, flu in the 2009, even flu in the 2013 and 2015. So our response to the COVID-19 this year uh, demonstrate uh, the investment in the past uh, a few years uh, it was. So we uh, have capacity to isolate virus. We have the capacity to develop the guidelines and uh, to contain the epidemic quickly. So uh, both countries uh, have a uh, good system there, but still have a way to improve. Over. Now, thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wu, for that. And we're going to come back to you in just a, a minute to look at this question of detection and communication. Uh, but one of the panelists, uh, Professor Bruce Lee, is a specialist on trying to detect outbreaks, to see the flow of these. And he's doing that, uh, together with others, in marshalling data and using data to help decision makers anticipate problems and respond to them. Professor Lee, could you say something more about the systems that uh, are in place on that front. Yeah, th thanks Clay, and thanks for having me on the panel. So one thing that we need to keep in mind is that the public health system, the response to an epidemic, is only a very small percentage of what the public health system should be. Uh, so public health systems also, we talk about preventing disease, and that's another portion of public health systems, but it's also only a portion. You know, in actuality, public health systems are actually very well integrated with other systems or should be well integrated with other systems, with economic systems, with social systems, et cetera. And in general, throughout the world, there's been chronic underinvestment in public health. There's been, for instance, in the United States, there's been investment in healthcare responding to disease. So after someone has developed a disease or problem, you know, there's been investment in terms of treatments and things like that. But what we really need globally is an elevation of public health systems in general. 
because we do see a lot of uh, problems. You know, COVID-19 has really exposed a lot of the um, weaknesses in public health systems around the world. And we have to remember there were other problems like the global obesity epidemic um, and, you know, uh, mental health issues around the world, uh, many chronic diseases and those things that have been going on for the last several decades. So what's really needed is a combination of uh, better data systems, um, surveillance systems to really understand what are the health problems around the world. And these are both infectious diseases and non-infectious diseases. Um, and you know what the status of them are and how those diseases might be spreading. So for instance, in the case of an infectious disease like COVID-19, you know, we've been talking for the past uh, decade, it wasn't a question of if a, a pandemic will occur, it was a question of when. So we know that throughout the entire world, we constantly have uh, viruses and different types of pathogens that might be moving between uh, animal species and humans. And so that's gonna occur periodically. And what you really need to do is you need to really understand how these diseases are moving bef long before they actually uh, move to humans. And when they do move to humans, you know, how can you catch them very early? And how can you put in preventive measures? And so that means data. So you basically need to have surveillance. And, and I wanna emphasize that we are now uh, a global society. I mean, we are interacting with each other. We've got, we've got uh, travel between countries. We've got uh, economies that are interlaced. Uh, we've got just a lot of movement. So we have to view ourselves as a connected world. And so that when there's a health issue that occurs in one country, it can quickly become a global issue. So we really need a system where countries are all cooperating with each other, operating together, sharing information, sharing data, so that then we can uh, pivot and have the world's expertise address these disease issues as quickly as possible uh, so that they don't explode to become you know, a, a global issue or global concern. Um, so you know, really putting in these data systems and also putting the technology that, that can actually analyze these data rapidly and connect it with different types of specialists. So I also want to say the quote unquote positives going forward from the pandemic is this has helped us understand what some of these deficiencies are. Of course, in the community, we've, we've known this for a while, but, but it's helped the broader society hopefully understand these things so that we can identify ways to develop these data systems and technologies that can then help prevent uh, further disease and help uh, collaboration. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of brain power uh, in uh, different countries, you know, um, U.S. and China has a tremendous amount of brain power. So how can we harness this and work together to find ways to uh, not just prevent disease, but actually improve overall health? So that's what we really want to do. Uh, Professor Lee, thank you for that. I, I really appreciated your emphasis that, hey, this is a global community. And so... Uh, weakness in public health systems in one place easily has an impact on other places. We are far more connected today than ever before. Uh, certainly there's been trade and travel for centuries, but if you just want to look to SARS from SARS in 2003 to today with the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, just look at one statistic there are three times as many flights linking the United States and China today than at the time of SARS. On an average day, 8,000 people come from China to the United States. On an average day, a pre-COVID-19 day, 6,000 Americans go to China. There's incredible population flow. And of course, that's just talking about the US and China. We're talking about an interconnected community. Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, all part of this, of this community. Now I'd like to turn to Dr. Sparfka, if we could for a minute, to look at private industry. You've been looking at, uh, you've been the deep experience on the private industry side, looking at epidemiology in, uh, at Procter & Gamble, looking at the creation of medicines and these sorts of things. 
Could you say something about the role of the private sector in the public health, uh, the robustness and responsiveness of public health systems? So um, your invitation here prompted me to review uh, the 2005 Health and Human Services document describing what we're going to do in a pandemic. And I was struck by the fact that most of the response focused on distribution and, and stockpiling vaccine. So it assumed that we had something to fight, <laughs> whatever it is becomes a pandemic. This particular, uh, uh, the current environment, we don't have the cure. We, we, we're learning as we're going about how this particular virus is working. Now, as a scientist, I think we're doing uh, all that we can to understand the mechanics of the virus, uh, uh, the transmission, you know, the science behind the virus, where there becomes a little bit of a, uh, an issue is communicating that to the public and engaging the public in the proper response. And there's a lot of strange information and responses going around, and I think it adds a little bit to the confusion. Uh, having said that, um, the response from industry has been quite amazing, if you think about it. Uh, they are in the process of doing clinical trials to test the effectiveness, the efficacy of vaccines in susceptible populations. Uh, this has occurred within the span of six months. Quite impressive. Now, again, the communication is by the end of the year, we'll have something. Mm. Now, I'm not sure that's true. But nonetheless, uh, it sets an expectation that may or may not be fulfilled. So, so while I think science is grinding through this particular pandemic and, and collecting the information necessary to make good decisions, the expectation is it will all be over whenever we find something. And I, I think that sets expectations that may or may not be fulfilling to the regular person in the, in the population. So uh, one of the things that I think is necessary going forward is better ways to communicate. Certainly I think the scientists throughout the world are communicating. And one of the most effective measures I've seen so far is where I get all my information is websites, CDC and Johns Hopkins in particular, and publication from uh, New England Journal and JAMA. All of the COVID articles are free. I, that's nice. Uh, that's a great communication mechanism. A lot of the articles are coming out of China. We're learning a lot about the epidemiology, about the immunology, about gene sequencing. They're all being published. They're all out there. Communicating it in turn and translating risk in population to risk in individuals is where I think we've fallen quite short. And that, you can tell by the questions coming in, why are we doing this and not doing that? Uh, so, so that need, we need to do a better job of that. And part of the issue has been everybody feels the need to get up and explain what it is they think about what people should do rather than having a more um, sort of thoughtful and collective approach. Uh, this epidemic is, is quite different because it isn't all about science. It's about a public response to some of the recommendations coming from our uh, public health officials. Uh, clarity is, is certainly uh, the, a rule here. How do we communicate risk a little better? How do we impart wisdom to everybody in the population that will allow them to react in a calm and efficient manner, if you will. 
So those are my thoughts. I, I compliment my colleagues in industry, uh, developing a vaccine in six months, testing it, doing phase three clinical trials already. It's, it's very impressive. Unprecedented, really. So yeah, and it's, it's definitely, it's happening all over. Uh, we see developments uh, of treatments and vaccines in China. We see it in the United States. We see it in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, and you mentioned two sources of information, and you highlighted uh, well-established, well-respected sources, such as the CDC websites, uh, the you know major publications, things like that. And of course, in the popular press, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, many organizations are making uh, COVID-19 related articles available to everybody, free of charge, you know, that sort of thing, trying to disseminate information. Let's get a little bit deeper into communication. Uh, you, uh, Dr. Sparfka highlighted effective communication between uh, scientists, regardless of nationality, regardless of place where you're working. And I'd like to turn to uh, Professor Wu and Professor Lin to talk a little bit more about this. And specifically, uh, in you know, asking uh, Professor Wu to talk about uh, the identification of the disease, the communication with international organizations. Uh, Dr. Sparfka mentioned making the genetic sequence available so that researchers could get to work wherever they were, that sort of thing. So, Professor Wu, could you say a little bit more about the detection communication aspect of things? And this relates, obviously, specifically to COVID-19, but also more generally. And if you'd like to go ahead and share some information about China's response and China's data exchange with international organizations and with colleagues in other countries, this would be a great time to do that. Okay, great. Thank you for the uh, opportunity. Uh, I want to share with you just one slide uh, very quickly. So, uh, when we report the uh, outbreak alert at uh, end uh, for last year, then uh, we immediately report that to WHO and other countries, including United States, Korea, Japan, and the European countries, even we do not know the pathogen for the outbreak. So that uh, information sharing is very important. Then uh, what we isolate a virus and uh, we shared our etiology result with the WHO in the uh, January 9th. And um, we report our daily uh, epidemic uh, since January 11th. Then we shared a sequence with WHO on January 12th. So that timely sharing information, it's very important to respond to the uh, outbreak. And it's uh, uh, very good to WHO and to all other countries as well. So I want to emphasize China's early response uh, very quick. So it only takes seven days to isolate a pathogen, the novel coronavirus as uh, etiology. It only took two days to develop test kits that are sent to uh, Wuhan for diagnosis. I think most important is the sequence share with the WHO, make every country can uh, to develop their own test kits. That's great. So the four scientific uh, finding, virus isolation, develop test kits, determine incubation period, determine transmission model, that are four scientific findings uh, laid a foundation for formulate a uh, control strategy. So I stop uh, talking about the slides. I go back to uh, communication. I think it's very important. After the SARS outbreak, United States sent a delegation to China, talk with uh, Chinese officials. How can we set up uh, effective communication when outbreak comes in the early stage? So after SARS, we uh, develop a mechanism to communicate with uh, our neighboring countries. So we, even any uh, outbreak, so we communicate with the United States uh, CDC, with uh, Korean CDC, with uh, uh, Japan CDC, and also European CDC. 
So all this communication for uh, at a professional level is very helpful to send a message to a uh, relevant uh, collaborator. That's it's a very effective information sharing. And uh, also important it, uh, for communicating with the public. So we also take a lesson in the uh, SARS outbreak. So I still remember when uh, Bernard, that time he, he was uh, um, UNA's director in the China. Uh, he said, if you do not share information with the public, people uh, worry about, concerned. Once you transparent, share the information with the public, then people get confident and uh, are confident to, uh, to trust uh, your response. So that lesson we took. So uh, responding to COVID-19, uh, we are transparent. We have daily press conference. So each day, we report the uh, new information about epidemic and also uh, to share with our concerns with the public as well. So that transparent communication is very important. So there are the challenges we faced. When we communicate with the public, because there are so many pro technical terms, te terminology, it's very difficult to uh, use the professional terminology with the general public. So that it's create a lot of confusing and also rumors as well. People use that uh, communication uh, to dissimulate because these days they have many, many uh, platform, not just like uh, newspaper, television, they have so many different new media. Uh, everyone could be a journalist, could send news, everybody could make news, so could make story. That also makes the communication become challenge, how to deal with that new challenge. So I'm but, stopping here, I'm over. Uh, thank you so much. And one of the uh, great points that you just made was the speed at which uh, the disease was identified, the genetic sequence of the disease was identified and then shared. And so one question I have for uh, uh, the panel, for the public health experts is, is this, you know, much quicker than the norm, much slower than the norm? It seems uh, from an outsider to have been a rapid, relatively rapid response. But you also make the point that we are connected not just in the pathogens we may share, but also in the communication, in the ideas that we can transmit. And unfortunately, not everybody is relying on the most reliable sources of information. And in the absence of information, uh, a lot of imagination can go to work and people can uh, develop all sorts of ideas and share those ideas with others. And so Professor Lin, can you say something more about this communication, both within the scientific community, uh, the folks, the public health specialists, but also to the broader public? Yes, I, I think the professional communication has always been very strong and has strengthened internationally. And I think that the speed with which information about COVID, the virus, or the scientific research has been extraordinarily rapid. And I think we're very fortunate as a human race that that is the case. Um, because there's still so much unknown and we really have to work on it together. But, you know, I was actually in um, Guangdong on January 19th um, at a public health meeting and the people in Guangdong, the groups, had already been communicating with each other, getting prepared. So clearly, I mean, there's no need for them to be out there in the public saying, we think something is gonna happen, but we don't know what and cause panic, right? But they are very much communicating with each other, getting prepared. I was personally surprised. 
at the scale with which their preparation was happening. So this is all really important part of what goes on in the profession. But I think, you know, it has taken public health people the world over a lot of not so good experiences to learn to be able to communicate with the public. Um, and we need to have this partnerships with people who are professional communicators. Um, and we need to have the partnership with actually social scientists, anthropologists, sociologists, who can really help us understand the cultures, the different language and what it means to people, the context within, with which people interpret information. People may use the same words that mean completely different things. What we see is that the social media has really created bubbles that we can each live very comfortably within. And there's also a very good research by computational social scientists looking at code retweeting. So not just people randomly retweeting, but an organized process in order to create rumors and to spread um, falsehoods often. So what we might call infodemics that we have seen with, with this pandemic. So I think this is where we really have to have very good partnerships across scientific and community organizations and across the different professions to really work together and to understand that, you know, trust is vital. Some people trust government and want to hear from government. Some people don't trust government, don't want to hear from government. Some people will trust their churches. Some people will trust the schools. Some people will trust the women's group that they are a part of and so on and so forth. So really understanding social networks and how we work with social networks is a critical part of communication as well as managing the uh, epidemic. Now, thank, thank you for that and emphasizing, you know, how you communicate and the necessity of communication. Uh, and one of the things that's come out of this is you have to start communicating even before things are fully understood, uh, even before you can say A, B, and C will happen in this sequence. You still need to be out there. Now, two of our panelists who have been very involved on public platforms with trying to communicate, not just about this, but about other issues as well. And I wanna come back to the group on you know, the, the larger public role, but I'd like to ask Professor Lee and Professor Young to say something about uh, the challenges you have had to overcome in order to get uh, you know, big data ideas communicated to a public that, that may be less familiar with how you talk in these terms. Uh, Professor Lee, could you start us? Yeah, I, I do want to add that while, while there's been communication amongst the scientific community, I, I think there's a significant room for improvement in terms of uh, exchanging ideas. And, and, and uh, so, you know, we've seen some rapid communication through um, uh, journal articles, et cetera, but we, there, you know, many times scientists still exist in silos and, and clusters, and so there hasn't been as much communication amongst the different disciplines and across different countries as we would like. Um, you know, similarly with the uh, with the investments um, into like therapies and treatments and you know, vaccines, et cetera. Uh, you know, I, I should give an example. You know, after the SARS outbreak occurred. Uh, in 2002, 2003, there were efforts to to develop a SARS vaccine, but the problem is the funding dried out after the after the outbreak. We would be in a very different situation if that investment continued, um, because you know we, then we wouldn't be in this this rapid reactive phase. So one of the challenges right now, I think, is we need to move from a reactive um, situation to a proactive situation, where you know, in between these health emergencies, we're actually developing or investing in to develop a lot of these different types of therapeutics, or vaccines, or surveillance systems, etc. And you know, we can really establish some great uh, public-private partnerships to do that. So I think there's a real opportunity to do that in advance. And you know, I want to separate reaction from from um, from proactivity. Same thing with 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 communication as well. 
one of the challenges is, okay, suddenly when you have an emergency, you have to jump and just say, okay, this is what's been happening. This, this is the research that's occurring. And that's something that should occur regularly, that science should be regularly integrated into uh, the public dialogue. Because you, know, you have to do a lot of backtracking. You have to explain, okay, yeah, there is this virus. And yes, you know, viruses uh, jump um, periodically to humans, et cetera. That, has, that discussion has not been in the general public eye for, for, um, for many years. And we can't wait until emergencies to suddenly say, okay, you know, let's, let's, let's back up. And this is what the research has been doing for the past 10 years or 20 years. And this is where the science is. Because that can lead to confusion and that can leave a vacuum where you are saying, okay, you know, other people may be moving in and trying to fill those gaps uh, in knowledge and many times with in misinformation or information that's uh, wrong direction. So we really need to change the system so that science is really well integrated into public dialogue, public discourse, entertainment as well. You know, making sure that movies and all those things are really representing science in a, in a proper way so that people become more fluent in, in this subject, in this area, um, because then there's just too much catching up to do during an emergency. And also, you know, from the scientific community side, you know, this scientific community needs to learn to, to explain things in a way that the general public can understand. You know, one of the challenges that we've seen over the years is there's been an increasing use of jargon and, uh, you know, very specific language to each of these disciplines. It's gotten to the point where sometimes disciplines can't even talk to each other, different scientific disciplines. You know, I remember a situation, you know, I've been in the global health space for, you know, the past 15 years, and I remember a situation where we were uh, in the UK uh, in a meeting in Oxford, and there was a co collection of different disciplines, and for the first several hours, People who were debating over, you know, what is the definition of the word tool, T-O-O-L. And these were different scientific disciplines. And there's a, you know, very uh, vigorous debate. And that took several hours. And that shows that, you know, the language is not even common amongst the scientific community. So what we really need to do is come up with a more uh, general language that everyone uh, can understand and speak, et cetera, because there needs to be shared knowledge. Again, there's tremendous amount of brain power and talent in many different disciplines, and not just scientific discipline, non-scientific disciplines, the business world, et cetera. And the only way that we can really harness this talent altogether is to have shared common language and shared common understanding. So really saying, you know, it's not enough for someone within a specific area to understand something. It's important uh, to communicate across. And there's just not enough investment in that. Um, and I think that can really change. Uh, thank you for that point. And in fact, I'd like to pivot a little bit based on what you've just said in terms of, uh, you know, public health systems have to be up and running all the time. And you've just highlighted the importance for scientific public, ed public education to be going on all the time. Uh, that we need to address this knowledge deficit, you know, before the pandemic. We need to be talking about this. And in the Q&A section, we have several people who have raised the question of prevention. Now, one of the areas, and I'd like to pivot a little bit away from COVID-19 and the crisis that that's, uh, you know, generated worldwide, to the broader work of public health, uh, which is connected to prevention, but also dealing with chronic diseases and other infectious diseases, uh, disseminating best practices across professions, that sort of thing. Now, Professor Young, you've been involved with a lot of preventative work, uh, promoting campaigns, against tobacco, for example. And you've done this in the face of, uh, you know, a big challenge, a lot of smokers, powerful industry players, that sort of thing. Can you say for a moment, just for a moment, talk a little bit about what you've learned in terms of public education on important questions such as reducing tobacco use? So I think it's for the public health education of, um, 
it's a lot of satanity. Of course, in every country, have a different satanity. But it's in China, it's the uh, just uh, it's talk the tobacco control. So, but the past the 10 or 20 years, I think maybe if we say some point is successful, I think just uh, it's the public affairs education. Because we know it's tobacco control is we should the advocacy for the policy change and a lot of, but it's with the view it's ours work. I think in China maybe some is the successful point just for the um, change the behavior is by the public health education uh, because. Of course, there is a lot of the, uh, the methods and uh, it's the program. Um, but I think it's a point, um, it's, the, it's a key point. It's, it's how to base on the cultural and the um, country's the, um, social norm and so on. So then it's the easier to the, uh, change the behavior. Sometimes said uh, it's the policy of it's important, but in China because it's a tobacco company is very very strong. So it's so it's the change policy is not easy, but uh, compared is a change the people's the behavior. And we think uh, it's the past uh, the twenty years, uh, it's the a uh, better. Okay. No, thank you. And uh, Professor Wu, you've been involved in trying to change behaviors, uh, people to get them to adopt safer practices, uh, worrying about drug use, worrying about uh, you know the the safety of transfusions, these sorts of things, uh, safe sex practices with regard to HIV/AIDS. Can you say something about your experiences in the public education realm? in those areas? So public, public education is very important, particularly uh, for the uh, wide range of coverage for HIV AIDS program. So one of strategy is uh, testing. How to promote HIV testing, make people recognize testing is a very important strategy to diagnose uh, for people infected. That is, uh, so, effective way to uh, stop or prevent HIV transmission. So we run a big campaign, uh, we call the testing campaign uh, around 2004, 2005. At that time, it's a very controversial in the China and also we get, get uh, critics from uh, uh, international agencies. So we try, we believe it's very important that we uh, continue to do uh, key population testing. So that uh, testing itself mobilize all the community to participate. That itself is a great education program. So that educate the government officials, educate the general public about HIV AIDS policy in China and also about the knowledge. So promoting HIV testing itself, so it's a mobilize the whole society to recognize response to HIV is very important and the test HIV testing is the first step to identify HIV infected people. Then you provide uh, uh, antiretroviral therapy to reduce their ri uh, risk of sexual behavior to reduce their further transmission. So that's uh, critically important then the people may understand to, uh, to cooperate, to uh, accept. Now in the China testing, I think each year we have over uh, 200, over 200 million tests per year. But that is about uh, one set of total tests for HIV globally. So it's a huge number of testing that are testing uh, making uh, HIV identified identification uh, feasible and uh, make a program easily to uh, move. And also now 
testing become more feasible, uh, we have web-based self-testing program. People can just go to a website to book a test kit themselves to test. No, right. thank, you. thank you. No, thank you for that. And thank you for highlighting uh, that, you know, stemming the transmission of disease, the detection process, making that part of the information flow, uh, saying this is about this disease and we are testing and making that, uh, that action uh, part of the public education. And I, I want to come back to Professor Lin in just a moment, but first I'd like to turn to Dr. Sparvka. Uh, because of your experience in the private sector, uh, Procter & Gamble, of course, is, does all sorts of advertising. Amgen advertises for some of its products. Uh, the amount of money that's spent in the private sector uh, to inform the public about risks, about treatment options, about various things. I was wondering if you could say uh, something about the role, again, of the private sector in addressing the long-term education, information sharing aspects of public health. Sure. Um, so there's a couple of ways in which information, uh, industry supports information. Uh, it's highly regulated, the things you can and can't say or need to say within the context of a particular product, in this case a pharmaceutical. Um, there are also instances where industry will uh, provide and support a documentation of the problem itself, sort of a public service message with the thought that this builds interest and therefore there's a mechanism to bring the solution to this particular problem with the introduction of this new product. So there's kinds of two ways in which people in advertising and marketing work. One is to establish the problem and, and provide that information. And then secondly, the solution to the problem, which happens to be my really good drug that's very effective and safe. Now, the latter, my, my drug is effective and safe. The things you can and can't say are, are very regulated. We have to get approved uh, by the government to say the things we're going to say. So all that advertising has to go through uh, an approval process. The advertising that is a little less restrictive is the scope of the problem. Here is a problem and, and these are the things you need to consider going forward. That is, is less restrictive, but people aren't interested necessarily in spending lots of money on that. Uh, they're more interested in promoting their products. So there's a little bit of a dichotomy there. Could we do a better job of promoting the importance of this particular uh, disease or public health crisis? Certainly. Uh, the motivation is we have a solution. We, we have a solution for you, the consumer. We have a solution for you, the formulary. We have a solution for you, the country. Uh, without that, there is a disconnect. So that's very important. You want a solution before you start, you know, marketing your product. And that's just the, that's just the nature of business. Uh, it is regulated, the things you can and can't say. You'll notice at every end of the advertising, there is a disclaimer that describes all the safety issues. And there done very rapidly and quickly. And in the meantime, you see all these people leaping in joy because they're taking a drug that is miraculously, uh, you know, turning their, their life around. Uh, some, some is not allowed. In Europe, you, don't, you, cannot, you cannot do this uh, simply because people take advantage of it uh, inappropriately. But uh, in the U.S., it is allowed and defended rigorously by the industry. 
Well, and one of the points that you just mentioned uh, with regard to communication is you're certainly reaching different audiences with your messages. And several times uh, in this session, people have raised questions about funding. Uh, Professor Lee, for example, noted that funding dried up uh, in the campaign to create a anti-SARS vaccine. And no, vac no such vaccine exists, uh, partly as a result of the end of the work on that front. And of course, pharmaceutical companies, governments, universities, all of us are engaged in you know, various research funding, but also some implementation questions. And I'd like, uh, one of the things that many people on the call and in general are interested is the role of the state in terms of assuring safe food, safe medicines. That was what Dr. Sparfka was just talking about with regard to what you can say and not say about your particular product, safe drugs, safe medical devices, these kinds of things. So we don't have food and drug uh, administration people in the seminar right here, but I was wondering, Professor Lin, if you could say something uh, first about the role of public health systems in this, and then move again to the question of healthcare reform. And in the United States, healthcare reform has been about increasing accessibility, reducing cost. Uh, maybe some success on the former, not much success on the latter. And you know, that gets to the healthcare economics of the United States, but in other places with universal healthcare systems, uh, it's dealt with somewhat differently. So I've, I've put two giant things uh, before you and please try to address them. Thank you, I will give my best shot. I think if we look at the history of public health, what we see is that health protection and regulation is actually very much at the core. And this really comes from citizens expecting to be protected. And governments derive legitimacy from a stewardship function where they're looking after the health and safety. So historically, you know, we see consumer product safety, we see food safety, we see um, safety and regulation of medicines, we see occupational health and safety. These are all, I think, really important early measures to not only protect people for the sake of it, but actually also to produce a more productive workforce. So health and the economy actually go hand in hand here. So therefore we have to understand that health, public health law is actually a core part of health systems, uh, public health systems. And for every government, it's very important to review, update, reflect the most, the least intrusive tools possible, the best data to help drive implementation, the incentives that one could give rather than be heavy handed in the regulation, but ultimately deliver the goods. So I think public health law is probably one of those underappreciated fields, but very, very important in the way that we constantly need to update and re reform. Um, and if we actually have good regulatory systems, then that goes a long way towards prevention. And if we do prevention well, then hopefully it will actually reduce the need for medical care. Unfortunately, um, medical care continues to be what people want. So therefore, we really have a challenge of how do we build a continuum of care from prevention to treatment to rehabilitation and palliation. So it's really, there's a public health way of thinking about public health systems and healthcare systems together. And here, primary healthcare is actually at the core. Primary care is the pivotal point between the first contact for the individual to seeing individuals who show up with the same problems and therefore thinking about population level interventions. So developing a really strong primary healthcare system absolutely needs to be 
at the core of any health reform. And globally, I'm afraid we've been talking about this for 40 years, and I'm not sure that we've got a perfect system yet. But if we look at the Chinese reforms in 2009, there were five pillars to it. And, and I give China a lot of credit for thinking systems in the reform. The first is that the state was going to fund an essential public health services. So recognizing that, you know, there's a lot of externalities, that there are differences in culture, in health literacy levels, in people's care seeking behavior, and whether they value prevention or they have the luxury of valuing prevention. So the government has to put money into prevention and making sure everyone, particularly those most at risk, actually benefit from preventive services. This is a really important part. The second part that the Chinese government did was to actually massively develop general practitioners and community health services, so developing the primary health care. The third part was to actually um, getting a good a supply and distribution system for medicines. So trying to control the cost, trying to ensure the quality and safety, ensure the accessibility, it's a very tough job, you know, because this is where a lot of money is. Um, uh, the fourth part was actually removing the financial barriers to access. So universal health coverage, means everyone should have access to quality services without suffering financial hardship. And so the rural population in China in particular um, did not have the kind of access and benefit. So this was about making sure that everyone had the financial coverage and in 10 years they achieved 95% coverage of the entire Chinese population and we know that's a lot of people. Um, the last part, which they knew was the hardest part, so they called it pilot hospital reforms. Because, you know, they had a system where the incentives was towards high volume, more care, more profit, um, and it wasn't necessarily about the health of populations. So this was a 10-year reform that's delivered many of the goods. But China now has gone further and said, that's not enough. We want to actually thinking about creating a healthy population. So in 2018, they released the policy Healthy China 2030, where they recognize that in order to keep people healthy, they had to address environment issues. They had to address urbanization issues. And all these, you know, things which are outside of the individual's control and sit in that larger environment is a matter for government agencies to actually coordinate and cooperate and to have coherence across the policy space. So this is something that many countries in the world are also trying to do and recognizing the more we can actually create healthy environments that makes healthy behavior the easier behavior, the better we can actually manage the healthcare system. And of course, now we see this huge growth of telemedicine and artificial intelligence that has been really extending access. And of course, the current pandemic has been a catalyst everywhere for this. So I think. There's a huge agenda around prevention and healthcare reform, and we must think about the healthcare reform and the health system transformation and public health hand in hand and not treat them as two separate baskets. Yeah, these uh, you know, might be separated intellectually, but in a practical way in terms of delivering service and how, and, and how they can work uh, to deal with problems and to prevent problems. They have to be much more integrated. We have to see them as such. Now, one of the things that was highlighted by Professor Wu and also Professor Lee was public education. And so Professor Lee talked about the role of uh, entertainment in that. 
And in fact, at USC, we have a Hollywood and health program at the Norman Lear Center talking about integrating, uh, you know, integrating uh, HIV AIDS education, and now looking at other issues, including environmental factors, these sorts of things. And we also have a center for health journalism, trying to communicate these things more effectively. And so that ends my USC commercial uh, for the moment. But I want to I want to come back to the question of technology. And this is something that Professor Lin just highlighted. We have received many questions involving telemedicine. And one of the reasons for telemedicine is that we have large underserved populations. And we see in China the explosion of these private, privately funded uh, websites that disseminate health education, health information. And we know that tele, uh, telemedicine has really exploded uh, in the United States with the COVID-19 crisis, that this is one way that basic healthcare is being delivered in a safe way. And so I would like to begin with Professor uh, Lee and then go to Professor Wu to talk a little bit about technology and public health. Uh, Professor Lee. So, yeah, so I, good points uh, made all around. I think uh, one thing I wanted to add is, you know, we really need to shift the conversation about public health and health. It's viewed too much as a cost, and it actually should be viewed as an investment and a, a, a sea of opportunities. Yeah. Uh, you know, my career uh, actually spanned both, you know, the uh, public and private sector. I work in equity research. I worked at... Um, uh, in, in uh, different industry roles, et cetera. And there's a lot more similarity between, you know, the business public sector and the private sector than, you know, people uh, often talk about, you know, they're actually quite interlinked and very similar worlds. And, you know, you know, especially since we're talking about, you know, the, the uh, U S and uh, heartland and, and, and China, you know, there's so many opportunities, so many business opportunities, so many investment opportunities um, in ways that we can transform health and public health. Uh, if you think about it, when, company, uh, when, when countries first are trying to establish themselves, one, what's one of the first things they do? They try to establish a good health system because they realize that the healthier their citizens are, the more they can do other things. Without health, you can't do anything, right? Without health, you can't, you can't tweet, you can't be on Instagram, you can't uh, you know, use consumer goods, you can't do anything else. So that's at the baseline. But what happens many times is after countries develop and grow and expand, they forget, they lose their roots. They forget the roots are health and that we really need to go back and that's how we allow people to do things. So to, to, to address your question, Clay, uh, there's so many opportunities to develop new types of technologies to really expand health and public health. You know, we, we shouldn't wait until these emergencies where we said, oh my goodness, we do need telehealth. You know, we do need a situation where you can, you know, this is something that could have been done a number of years ago where people say, okay, how do we try, how do we change healthcare? How do we improve healthcare? How do we improve public health? Well, do we really need a situation where people uh, have to go to a clinic to take care of everything or go to an emergency room to take air, care of everything. The reason why we have overcrowded in emergency rooms is people don't have access to healthcare. So that's the only thing they can use if they want to see a doctor. Well, why can't we change the system so that you know certain things can be taken care of via telehealth? Not everything, of course, but certain things can be taken care of via telehealth. And therefore you can get, give access to people who may be in uh, rural areas which are far from large medical centers or uh, areas which are underserved. And it doesn't just have to be that. It can be people who have regular health care, but you know, they don't need to go to the clinic for everything. That's an example of technology facilitating a change, a systems change. And so what we need to be thinking about is how can technology uh, marry with health and establish new opportunities? So new economic opportunities, new growth industries, uh, industries that we you know, we, we can't, we, we're not going to be able to do things the same way that we've been doing for years. So there might be 
enormous opportunities that can create tremendous number of jobs uh, and and uh, and greater return on different types of investments. And we need to be thinking about those things and how can the, one of the problems is technology. A lot of the technology that we that has been emerging, say from Silicon Valley, et cetera, has been to address you know maybe a very small sliver of needs. Okay, well you know I need to. You know, I need a taxi cab or a cab. Okay, well, you know, you can have this ride sharing app or, you know, I need to do this thing differently in terms of organizing my life. Okay, there, there's this app or I need to adjust how, you know, my portrait looks like. I can put some ears on my portrait or something like that. Well, that's all good. But like those, that's just skimming the surface. There's so many ways we can take that technology and then, and then marry it to like some of these bigger problems. And then not only can we solve these bigger problems, but we can create huge opportunities. We can hu create huge professions and industries that didn't exist. And this could give a lot of tremendous amount of uh, job opportunities. So I really want to encourage us to think about how can we, you know, again, when we're talking about the heartland of the United States and China, how can we create new opportunities that, you know, didn't even exist before? And, and, and you know, really take the optimist role and say this, you know, this pandemic is exposing these, all these different possibilities. And, and I really do appreciate, uh, uh, we've got Mike waving at me. Uh, oh, uh, Dr. So I, Dr. Sparfka, please go yeah, ahead. I am, I, uh, I'd like to add to that about how do we do this telemedicine and think about that in terms of industry and the development of drugs. Uh, typically, the old fashioned way is to get a clinical site, bring patients into that site, at huge cost, hundreds of millions of dollars to do this. Can we use this technology to eliminate sites and get participation from individuals where they live? And this is already going. So uh, an industry contribution may be, we've been successful in doing these sorts of very complica complicated clinical trials without the structures that typically accompany them. So that process is happening. I have a second uh, a comment, a personal comment, if you will, on telemedicine. As part of this COVID response, my physician's uh, uh, visit was canceled. And uh, he called me and said, do you want to do uh, telemedicine? Do you want to do something over the internet? And I said, yeah, that's great. Let's do that. So we did that. And you know, everything's well, I passed. And uh, I got a bill. Congratulations. Yeah, I got a bill. Uh, Medicare does not pay for that. So there's work to be done across the board systematically to ensure that telemedicine can be effective and viewed as a reimbursement. So, so more to be seen about that, I guess. Yeah, yeah, so that's, the, that's the, the way that economics, the, uh, 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 the economics involve getting the incentives right, right? Sure. Uh, you for both the patient as well as the provider and whatever umbrella provides for that. Uh, Professor Professor Lee, please go ahead. But then we need to to move forward. Yeah, I mean that's that's a way that you know you can use uh, you know federal investment to guide. Further investment, like if if the if uh, the federal government says, okay, you know, we will reimburse um, telemedicine, then suddenly there's going to be a lot more development in the area. That's been one of the things holding back. The same way you can you 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 can you can direct some directed investment, and ultimately other investments will flow that direction, like venture capital, uh, you know, uh, private equity, etc. So there needs to be sort of a strategy to say, okay, you know, these are the areas that need to be further developed, and then it, it'll be a cascade. Yeah. I, I want to let our five uh, panelists know uh, that I'm going to come to each of you in just a moment for your 30-second take on the way forward, emphasizing U.S.-China cooperation, ways in which the United States and China might work together to move us forward. But before I do that, I'd like to check in with uh, Professor Wu and to ask about a couple of the things that have just come up. Uh, one, Professor Lin emphasized the need for a robust, a, a, we need to have good care available at the primary level. 
And if you could say something about uh, what China has done to try to increase uh, the availability of pri uh, primary care physicians and tie that together with the technological revolutions that are at work. Uh, thank you for that uh, uh, question. Impossible I think, question. Yes. Yeah. I think in China, we do uh, emphasize the primary health care. We do have a policy to encourage people to seek in a care at uh, the community uh, health center. To, uh, they have a policy uh, to support that. And also, we strengthened uh, the uh, primary health primary health care, including a look at more funding. For example, uh, we have a population-based uh, unit uh, of uh, package care for primary care. So previously we have uh, per capita uh, 35 Chinese yuan, now increased to uh, 60 yuan uh, per capita. So that's a huge increase for supporting uh, public health care. In terms of new technology, I think what we discussed today, it's uh, actually use of technology. You best in the Los Angeles, Dr. Yang in the New York, <laughs> even in the Hong Kong. So we're on the same screen. So this technology used in the uh, COVID-19 response for uh, doctors who experienced to deal with uh, uh, sophisticated uh, uh, patients. Uh, so that, uh, uh, consultation is very helpful. Also, the technology we use, like in the China, we have Alipay. That payment is a, a good record for a patient to recall each day activity. For example, in Beijing, the uh, outbreak in the June, the first cases, he can remember the past 14 days. It's not just because he has a very good brain. So he look at his phone and check how much payment each day that reminded him where he visited. Then the local health authority can identify Shinfadi market as the source. So that's a very important technology being used. Then the big data being used for contact tracing uh, that help for, for uh, diagnosis cases in the early, all of these are very helpful to contain the epidemic. Over, thank you. Uh, thank you. Of course, developing the testing technologies. That was a, a big issue here in the United States. Uh, part of it was the America First agenda, rather than em employing, uh, you know, uh, devices or uh, tests developed elsewhere, that sort of thing. So you've highlighted uh, both technology and then also the contact, <coughs> contact tracing, the isolation, these sorts of things that have proven effective. Now, uh, to conclude, and thanks to all the people that are on the, uh, that have joined the webinar from across the world, thank you for your questions. We're going to ask each of our, each of our participants to within just 30 seconds or so, outline what you think might be an avenue forward where the United States and China can work to the betterment of our two peoples and for people everywhere. And we're going to begin, uh, all of you kind of manifest this in your own life. You've been involved in, the, in communication. You've been involved in working with colleagues across oceans, across distances. But let's begin with uh, Professor Yang, uh, who is in New York today. Uh, and has deep experience in both countries. Uh, Professor Young, what's the way forward? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's in New York. I observed it's the before, it's the May, it's uh, New York. Have not pay more attention for the testing and uh, tracing and uh, quarantine, but uh, after, the April, they just uh, is focused on this work. So that's the, it's in New York, the COVID-19, it's, uh, it's the decrease. So I think uh, it's for the new infection disease. Preventive is first, that's very important. When we have no more high-tech measures, 
So this is the very important. So that's why I think it's uh, it's in the future. Maybe it's we need. It's how to it's a create. It's the um, concept. Maybe the um, framework is how to the push the preventive is first. This is the idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Sparvka, you were just talking a little bit about uh, drug testing, clinical trials, this sort of thing. And of course, many pharmaceutical companies are collaborating with Chinese partners in this process. And now I want to turn to you again for the way forward. Uh, what, what might we do together? Well, I, I think, um, as some of your viewers have pointed out, is there an opportunity for the U.S. and China to build a relationship around uh, a global approach to public health and public health systems? Uh, much like uh, the U.S.-Russia collaboration in space, is there a collaboration between China and the U.S. for public health? And it, could, it, it, it isn't limited necessarily to the ability to track an epidemic. It's the ability to communicate. It's the ability to have the communication systems, the information systems, the technology, et cetera, to build a path forward that says, here is a way to do things that seems to be the benefit of all involved. That's my yeah. two cents. No, that's, that's great. And, and again, thanks for staying within our time, our time constraints. Uh, Professor Lee, you mentioned the obesity epidemic. Uh, which is a problem not just in the developed world, but also an issue in some developing countries, such as China, uh, and uh, genetic predispositions towards certain diseases, such as diabetes. One out of three diabetes sufferers lives in China. Can you say a little bit more what you see as some ways forward? So I think, uh, you know, it, these initiatives like the U.S. Heartland um, China um, initiative, as well as um, your, your center, are important because this increases communication between uh, the two countries and it will help people understand that really there's a lot, lot more similarities uh, and there's too much of focus on differences and that, uh, you know, you have the same situation, you have the same diversity of people, diversity of interests and all these different things. So there's a real opportunity to actually work together uh, to solve problems together. The obesity epidemic is an example. I mean, it's affecting both countries and affecting many countries around the world. There, there isn't differences in terms of the impact and a lot of the factors that are driving this. So again, I want to emphasize, uh, emphasize the uh, common interests, uh, find ways to increase communication, view health and public health as investments and opportunities and not costs. And really, these are, these are avenues to really work together. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Wu, you've received uh, some of your training in the Chinese heartland in Anhui, but you've also lived here in the United States in California and studied here. And now you have such an important role in China. Can you say something about the way forward? Professor Wu. In the past uh, few decades, uh, we uh, set up and strengthened uh, our collaboration between uh, China and the U.S. Um, that is uh, beneficial to both uh, countries. And uh, we uh, view, we, we have uh, same common interest. We also have a common goal to achieve. So we have a uh, great potential to continue our collaboration. And we also did uh, jointly to support African countries in fighting Ebola epidemic. So uh, I think they have a uh, great potential for us to continue our co collaboration, to continue our partnership. Thank you. No, thank you. And so we'll conclude this section with Professor Lin, who is an American who has worked uh, in Australia, is working now in Hong Kong. And Professor Lin, if you could also talk 
about the role of the World Health Organization. Now, I know that's the subject for a whole other webinar, but if you could say a word or two about uh, the WHO and how it works with both China and the United States and the importance of international collaboration. You know, I think the WHO really has two roles. One is as a secretariat and serving the member states. It is part of the United Nations. But the other is as the coordinating body for our global health and setting norms and standards. So I think we really have to think about these two functions and say, on the technical agenda, that way forward is to bring the scientists together to ensure that there's very good information sharing, there's collaboration on the research, on program evaluation, and on supporting other countries to increase their capacity, uh, whether it's infectious diseases or non-communicable diseases. But in supporting other countries, we move to that second row, which is perhaps more in the diplomatic space. And hopefully creating a bit of a safe space through science, through collaboration for people to come together and recognize that at the end of the day, when we're talking about health, we are one humanity. And the world, countries may need WHO as punching bags from time to time. But at the end of the day, the best that the WHO can do is to help bring countries together and to make sure that we live healthier lives. Very, very well said and a great way for us to go out. Uh, it's the humans against all the bad things that happen to humans. And we need to work together in this campaign. I just want to say thanks to our distinguished panel I, I have learned a lot during this. I hope that our viewers have learned a lot. And I want to ask our viewers to help us move forward. And the way you can do that is once the video of today's webinar is available at the U.S. Heartland China Association website and at the USC U.S. China Institute website, that you will pass it along, that you will add to the discussion by sharing this with friends, with colleagues, to get them on board with our shared effort, our need to work together. I want to conclude by thanking uh, the U.S. Heartland China Association for making this happen, for bringing us together. It's been a wonderful opportunity to work with Governor Holden, with Min Fan, and with all of you. So, for my part, it's time to say thanks and goodbye and good health. Take care. Stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah.